the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Talking about a new kind of bullying. Bullying that wasn't around when I was in school. Cyber bullying. How do we recognize it? What should parents do about it? How do we define it? Happy to have with us a psychologist who can talk all about this. Thank you for being here, Dr. Anna Settle. Uh, thanks for coming on. Sure, thanks for having me. All right, cyberbullying, this is, this is new territory. Um, we certainly hear a lot about it. We saw um, little Keaton Jones, right. poor little boy who was crying, and, and he had certainly been bullied. It's, it's part of our national conversation now. How big a deal is this? How concerned should parents be? It's a really big deal, and parents should be very concerned. I mean, we've seen a surge in suicide rates over the past five, six, seven years, especially in adolescent girls about age 10 to 14. It's tripled. Uh, so if you think about when children and adolescents are getting access to social media sites and also to tablets and cell phones, it coincides with that age group. So we are surmising that it is related to cyberbullying and so social media. Is it more um, of a threat to girls? Are girls more impacted or is it pretty pretty close to equal, girls and boys? It's difficult to measure that, but we have seen a greater increase in, in suicidality among girls. However, the rate of completed suicide is still greater among boys, and so it's difficult to tell who is at greater risk. I would say all children and adolescents are equally at risk. And how do we define this? When we're talking about cyberbullying, at what point could a parent look at a phone and go, wow, my kid is being cyber bullied? What is it? Well, so if you think about the traditional definition of bullying, it's repeated and intentional behavior that is intended to cause injury to another person. And so if you look at cyberbullying, it's essentially just the use of any sort of electronic device to bully. Uh, so you can look at social media pages, you can see if there are hurtful comments or pictures being posted. Um, you can check text messages if there are even exclusion. You know, if, if children are being left out intentionally, uh, that's a form of bullying. It can be through subtle actions. It doesn't have to be overt. And it's so, it's so disturbing because, I guess, kids, but even adults, we, we see this with social, social media. You can make a comment when you're sitting in your room at your desk or wherever, and, and you're not interacting with the person. You will make a comment that you might not normally make. Correct. You will say things you might not normally say. Absolutely. And then you think about the person on the receiving end of that, who reads that in their room, and just the devastation that would cause. Right. And that's where we are with this, right? That's right. And there are even social media sites where the person who is making the comment can remain anonymous. And so they can say whatever they want to say without any sort of repercussions. So what should parents do, in your opinion? How do parents deal with this? The biggest piece of advice that I can give is to be present when your children are using social media. You also want to make sure that you're not allowing them something that's not developmentally appropriate for their age. Uh, so we're seeing kids and you know small children that are having access to electronic devices and then you know kids going into middle school that already have access to cell phones and parents are not necessarily monitoring the interactions that are going on among friends. So being present op opening up dialogue about what exactly is bullying, uh, what should you do if a friend says something about someone else on a social media site, how do you talk about that? Um, you know, sometimes we tend to shame children when they say something negative about another person. So as parents, it's really important to say, hey, I heard what you said or I read what you wrote and it's important for us to have a conversation about this and here is why this can be so devastating because they're young, their, their frontal lobes are not fully developed, they don't see the world in the same way that their parents do and so it's just like any other sensitive topic, we have to walk them through that so that they can understand it. How much privacy do kids deserve? You know, there might be some who would say, well, you know, I'm going to I give them my phone, I trust them, I don't want to be a snooping type of parent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to go and read every message. I may get a sense of what they're talking about, but I'm not going to read every message and read every email. What is appropriate for a parent to do? And, and walk us through the various ages all the way up to 18. What's appropriate? 
That's a really good question. Uh, you hear people talk about helicopter parenting, and so there's been this huge movement to allow children and adolescents to work things out on their own, to not hover, to not make decisions for them. With social media and with electronic devices, the stakes are just too high. So you cannot allow privacy on those types of sites, in my opinion, at all because I feel like that parents need to be present and know at least something about what's ha happening on those sites and something about what's being said. So if there's one comment that is put out there and, and it's intended to hurt somebody who maybe has a history of depression or already has low self-esteem, the consequence of that can be so devastating that there really isn't room for a mistake. So you're saying you should be reading everything your kids email and text and put on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever the cool thing is. It's not MySpace. It's all this other stuff. Right, right. So whatever the cool <laughs> thing is, parents should be reading that stuff. Is Absolutely. That, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. You have a 17-year-old kid, you should be doing that. Absolutely. And how does that go over with the kids? I mean, how does that... I mean, I have a nine, seven-year-old, so I don't know, but I, this, this really scares me, thinking about all this stuff. You see this in your office. I mean, how, how does that go over when they're reading a 17, you know, 16, 17, those rebellious years? Right. They don't like it. In the same way that they don't like it when their parents catch them drinking alcohol and explain to them they're too young to do that. They don't like it at that age. They feel like, you know, they feel invincible. They feel like they know the answers. Um, I would say in retrospect, most children and teens, when they get a little bit older, appreciate that there are not a hundred pictures of them that have been posted on social media without somebody stopping it, you know, because sometimes, like I was talking about earlier with that frontal lobe de development of the brain, it's impulsivity and so there's a picture and they, they will post it and they don't necessarily think about the fact that that stays in cyberspace and how that can impact them for years you know down the road when they're applying for colleges or or job applications that type of thing see everything you're saying it disturbs me that's you're right mm -hmm. yeah in a moment they can post some picture and that picture is not going away right and they can say so, yeah that, that's terrible so what age in your opinion do you give um, a child access to a phone or a tablet or whatever? At what age do you give them a Facebook page and texting and, and all this stuff? I wish that there was a hard and fast answer to that. I think the biggest piece of advice that I can give is that it, you have to be in tune with how mature your child is and how developmentally appropriate is it for them. You know, there are some seventh graders who can be a little bit more responsible, whereas their peers are not ready for that yet. So I think that you have to really be cautious about what your child is ready for and don't just say, you know, all children in sixth grade seem to be getting a cell phone. Therefore, my child is now 12 and in sixth grade, I'm gonna fall in line and do that as well. I think you really have to know what they're ready for. Um, we were talking a, a minute ago about the wait until eighth movement. And so there are a lot of parents who are pushing for eighth grade before their adolescents have access to cell phones because it seems to be getting younger and younger. Uh, it used to be sixth grade that was sort of the cutoff and now I'm seeing people coming in and their elementary school children have cell phones. I'm seeing that too. They're elementary school kids with cell phones. Mm -hmm. And parents will say something like, well, it helps me, um, I guess, communicate with them, let them know that I'm coming to pick them up or something. They'll, they'll rationalize there's a reason for it. Right. And um, is there a reason for giving a kid in, in elementary school uh, uh, you know, a, a cell phone, do you think? Do you think that's just a bad idea? Well, there are other ways of communicating. So they have come up with the smart watches where you can only um, allow your child to have access to a, a limited number of people and you can control which numbers can and can't call that device. Uh, so if you are in a situation where you're a working parent, you're dropping a child off at practice and you need to be able to communicate should practice end earlier, there are other ways to communicate other than having a cell phone that has access to the internet. There are also landlines still, usually. You know, if your child's <laughs> going to a gym, you, you probably have a coach there or an adult there who can allow them to have access to a phone. Yeah, that is, I think, you think there's now, their parents are pulling back a little bit. So you've seen it, you said it was sixth grade, now there's this push for eighth grade. I think maybe people didn't realize 
what was going on with this stuff and maybe they were just like oh here's your new phone and, and everybody you think people are being more thoughtful about it or or still not I think we are broaching the topic a little more frequently and therefore people are listening and are a little more cautious about it um, I'm not quite so sure it's slowed down all that much yet. I think we're headed in that direction. I mean, it's definitely a socio-ecological problem. It is, you know, it starts within families, it's schools discussing it, it's the community discussing it, it's you and I discussing it so that people are in tune to what we're saying. So the more we talk about it, I think, I, I think we will see a greater push to wait longer before allowing them access. Let's go, before we go to break, let's go to Carl. we got a couple calls here. Let's go to Carl. Hello, Carl. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. What's on your mind? Man, I, I ain't no kid or nothing. I just, I'm 49. I deal with cyberbullying now. So if these kids are listening, you know, it, it ain't just going to end when you hit 18. It keeps on going. I I kind of stutter a little bit. And they, they start making fun of me on the social medias and stuff from work. And it's just, it's just something I got to battle with every day. I was going to ask her how how I should go about coming back to that and that. How do you go about if you are bullied? So here's somebody, 49 years old, I think he said. Obviously, we're not talking about a high school student here. We're talking right. about a grown adult. Right. What do you do? And that's just devastating because these are the people who are modeling for our children, the very people that should be showing them you know, inclusion and how to be kind and compassionate as opposed to making fun of somebody because they're not the exact same as we are. Um, so to answer Carl's question, if it's happening at work and among a network that is used at work, I would say that there, there are legal ramifications of that. And I think sometimes people are afraid to go that route because they don't want to make ripples within their network at work but you have supervisors and bosses who it's their duty to make sure that that is not happening um, and, and the impact on him mentally absolutely so he's at home now worrying about it he's calling into a show the impact on him i know he needs a, a job and a paycheck but right. the impact is it goes beyond uh, just the hours at work right and someone has to be his advocate you know if he is the victim of cyberbullying at 49 years old there's got to be someone within that workplace that can help him in you know talking to other people about the impact that it's having on him all right carl thank you for calling in thanks for sharing that we want to hear from others there's the number 615-737 plus 615-737 7587. We will take a break. Carol and others hold on the line. A few lines are open if you want to call. Uh, take a break. Be back right after this.